it might be on those of us who do have those wizard brains to kind of say, oh yeah, we've been here before. We've had to change up before. We've been walled up in towers before. We've had to radically shift our mindsets and start building whole worlds inside our heads before. We can breathe a little easier knowing a lot of this, even if only in an abstract way, isn't that foreign to us. Salutations, listeners, and welcome back to a special edition of Glitch Bottle. Today, we are talking about magic, COVID-19, finding your path in quarantine, and so much more with the esoterically elating Meredith Graves. Now, listeners, this is a special edition of Glitch Bottle with the wonderful Meredith Graves suggested title of Welcome to Malkuth. And nothing could be more appropriate as the entire world is grappling with the novel coronavirus COVID-19 pandemic. Meredith Graves is a witch and a magician, first and longest, whose practice continues to shape and inform every aspect of her subsequently multifaceted career. She's been labeled an open sorceress dedicated to making the magic behind her work as transparent and accessible as possible across disciplines from seamstressing and fronting hardcore bands to print journalism. Meredith hosted MTV News Worldwide for two years, including an infamously unprompted live discussion of astrology with Beyonce. And her current position is director of music for Kickstarter. And Meredith is also the occasional educator on the occult arts, specializing in the tarot. Foregoing entirely the predictable trajectories available to most career magicians, Meredith believes in education through accessibility, the kind exemplified best by living all life in a magical way. In other words, listeners, there is a very good chance that you've either seen Meredith before, you've heard her interviews, you've heard her music, or you've seen the awesome projects that support artists and creators that Meredith is involved in. And Meredith and I began chatting more than a year ago, and I've been a big fan of her work and her projects and how she helps creators. And it was a double honor to be interviewed by by Meredith for the Creative Independence Site, or TCI. Now, we'll be doing another entire episode with Meredith where she answers your Glitch Bottle patron listener questions, and she talks about magic, technology, seamstressing, a very important trait in the Solomonic tradition, and so much more. But for this episode, we wanted to get this out quickly as so many magicians, esotericists, creators, and others are likely sitting at home, quarantined, and with that term, it's used throughout the podcast, not meaning in the strictly medical sense, but rather that physical or social isolation that people are experiencing from others. And during this quarantine, many people might be at home wondering, how can I start walking down my magical path? Am I even defining magic correctly no matter where I choose to explore? What's the process of delving deep into practice? Or what should I even do before I even begin to practice? And after that, then what? What are the resources out there? How can we make room for joy and healing amid the COVID-19 pandemic? How can we hermetically seal our magical and practical actions to keep them safe. Well, Meredith shares about all of these topics and more. And now to welcome us to Malkuth and uncork the uncommon, I give you Meredith Graves. Meredith Graves, welcome to Malkuth, and uh, thank you so, so much for coming on this special edition of the Glitch Bottle Podcast. Alexander, if we can't cue up a couple bars of the Twin Peaks theme music here, I'm going to be so sad. (laughs) I'm walking my ass all the way back to Keither, and I'm never looking back. Um, (laughs) You made me sound like I do things with my time, but... but, uh, it's so awesome to be doing this. I really, I cannot tell you how happy I am and how excited I am, as you mentioned, like, including and beyond the interview that I felt so lucky to do with you for TCI. I am a public soapboxer and stan of Glitch Bottle and have been for so long. So this is really cool, not just to be on the show, but also to know, like, further that the show is good and the show is here for people and the show wants to like have these conversations and provide resources for folks who may be freaking out right now, which everyone is. So, yeah. <laughs> so there's that. 
your own ability to help artists, help creators, and practice magic and engage in esotericism, I think is not only rejuvenating and valuable, but I think it's unparalleled in many ways, and especially during the COVID-19 pandemic. But before we get to all that, you're in New York. How are you doing? I know it's kind of a silly question, but it is one of the hardest hit areas. And I think for the listeners out there, Meredith, can you share a little bit about if they themselves find themselves either in New York or in a hard hit area and they're quarantined? um, Can you kind of share a little bit about what are some of the things that you have found have helped you uh, just even on the physical side of quarantining and just how are you? Well, thank you. Yeah, I am in New York. I'm in Brooklyn, New York, where I've lived for a handful of years, which is also, you know, New York in general is currently the hotbed of cases of COVID-19 around the world. Personally, I physically, personally, you know, we're, we're, we're making new categories here in this new normal. Physically, personally, I am fine. As a person who was already here, I'm very lucky that I wasn't, you know, a tourist from far away or someone who is stuck here with nothing new around them. Like, I enjoy my neighborhood. I know many of my neighbors. I know the people around me are safe. I know I can still, you know, once a week go a few blocks to my grocery store. You know, even if the majority of our faces are covered up with masks, my neighbors and I still, you know, yell high from across the street like it's cool. But in general, it's like totally, totally terrifying. It's totally terrifying, as we talked about a bit prior to kind of be living in the gap that exists between the discourse of the experience of nurses and healthcare professionals and the discourse of politicians on television. When you're in New York right now, you kind of feel like you're in that uncanny abyss between those two discourses where like everyone else in the world who's not here is going to pick something to believe based on some of the they're like the bumpers on a bowling alley it's like you're just going to be bounced back and forth between the facts and the politics and like for those of us here it's you know it definitely adds another layer of glaze to the trauma yeah personally physically i am fine uh, mentally personally exhausted And absolutely nothing compared to what people on the front lines in the healthcare profession are dealing with and materials suppliers and folks that are now being labeled essential workers, which is a really pedantic term for people you don't think deserve $15 or more an hour all the other times that we're not in a global plague state. Yeah, there's no resolve, you know. This is where these conversations are about to get funny, Alexander, because we're both journalists. And so we're used to putting a period or a question mark on the ends of our sentences. And right now I have dot, 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 and then a series of punctuation marks that they use to represent swearing in like Doonesbury comic strips. That's about all I've got. But it is happening. The report from the field is that it is happening. That's for sure. I know the listeners and myself are definitely wishing you the best. And I, I know that the frontline caregivers that I speak with as well, I, I think the dot, dot, dot is certainly the most, uh, uh, definitely the most appropriate uh, thing because I think we're all, you know, moving through this and wondering how will things eventually resolve if they ever do. And, you know, with that said, Meredith, you, in addition to being the director of music for Kickstarter, and even though you're, as you mentioned, physically you are well, one of the big things is you're delving into esotericism, your different projects and areas and being able to help people. That's something that you did out and about. You've traveled a lot and you work with artists and creators to help them. When it came to quarantine and all of a sudden, I think many magicians and humanity, people are finding that their worlds become physically a lot smaller. How did that affect your own creative process? How did it affect working with other creators and artists in terms of what you do to help get them resources and support them? And how did it affect your daily magical practice? I mean, can you share with the listeners who might be might be struggling with that too, um, just from, a, from an esoteric and, and practical perspective? So this is a super interesting question, because per that sort of multivalent identity that I live in like a wet garbage bag, I do have to think about a few different approaches <laughs> to these questions. And yeah, when it comes to quarantine, what I have, you know, thought about a lot for the last few weeks, as I have balanced, you know, the concerns of my immediate life, friends, family, the well being of New York and my immediate surroundings, and the artist community and the ecosystem of creativity and connectivity on Kickstarter, 
I started to work on things at work. We started to put together resource lists and prompts for artists in need of immediate aid state by state. And we kind of started, I said, okay, fine. All of a sudden, you know, I've been in music a lot longer than the now nearly two years I've been Kickstarter's director of music. And the text started coming in from people way outside that realm. And I went, you know what? Quarantine. I got time for everybody, baby. And I just started clearing my schedule out. Right. So what I've had time to sit and think about really is like, all the other times that we have had things like plagues and we have had crises and, you know, not being literal here with plagues, but societal plagues almost in the expanded way of plague as if akin to the expanded way of talking about apocalypses, I think, or have thought a lot about the moment that, you know, John Dee and everyone saw the comet <laughs> or whatever it was streak across the sky and suddenly everyone knew something bad was going on, right? When societies are upended and when everything is chaotic and absolutely nothing feels stable and you don't know the source of the demon or property that's coming to upend everything, who do you go to? <laughs> who kind of canonically has to be already so removed that they're stable, probably pretty comfortable where they seem weird the rest of the time, getting a close eye up on any sort of apocalypse content, dealing with the darkest depths and the bodily and human gut reaction. I mean, what what have people done since time immemorial? Shit goes awry. You go to the edge of the wood and you go see the witch. The witch is the person who has to be stable when the shit goes bonk. And disclaimer, no, I don't mean that. And, and everybody's got to be perfect and feel great sense, because that is really not what I'm trying to transmit. For me, this is the, the understanding that I've sunken into as a history lover, thinking about where folks like me, folks like us have been like placed in, in the narrative when society has been in a state of upheaval prior. And so there is something to be said for throwing your windows open wide first thing in the morning and looking out down to the water that actually is the uncanny gulf between Brooklyn and Manhattan and like watering the plant you can barely keep alive and being like, who will come knock on my door today? you know, who's coming to see what the omen means for them. That is kind of like a, a mindset that has helped me retain some peace <laughs> in the street. I realize this is strange, but you know, if there is a sort of embodiment to be had here, that is how I have remained in touch with, with my personal sense of magic while sort of retaining the way that I do magic in, in context a bit in general, which is just a allowing it to permeate the entirety of my being. I can't not do it. My mind's just on it all the time. I love it. It's my favorite thing. But yeah, coming to that point of understanding with myself where I was like, in times of crisis, when literally no one knows what's going on, like we don't have to go that far back in history to figure out, and a lot of this information is being rehashed right now in the social discourse, interestingly enough, what we used to attribute plagues and illnesses to and how illness and random fits of illness tied into things like the witch trial. And like, there are so many angles to come at this from just sort of personally and creatively resting in the knowledge that it's not, oh my God, I'm terrified. I really want to help everyone. And I'm a hell, uh, I just, I want to do all this stuff and I feel so incapable. I don't know what to do. Like step pre zero, remember who tends the putrid cauldron when shit goes boink. And like rest in the knowledge that your esoteric lineage has been at the edge of the wood waiting for the clouds to darken and like take a breath for yourself. That has been very crucial for me is thinking about how all of this does fit into magic because from there I can reverse it and work my way back out. And to your point, Alexander, to realize our, our shared favorite phrase, how the quarantine has affected my artists is... I think you ask the question because you want an answer. Really, I took the question too. How does this affect my artists? And I wanted to run with it almost immediately. Because when I say the artists here, it's everyone from people I knew were going to launch projects on Kickstarter to my friends in the esoteric communities who were planning conferences that are getting canceled to this, that, and the other thing. I knew I wanted to make myself available. And without an actual answer to the question of how quarantine affects the artists I work with, because it is such a diversity of buds and co-conspirators that I'm talking to on any given day, I just knew that it would. And so I kind of threw myself in. This harkens back to the, have I leveled up in my emotional maturity under duress, or am I merely dissociating <laughs> the fun game, trying to get on it as fast as humanly possible to figure out all the ways to already have an answer when artists come around talking about how the quarantine is already affecting them to have, you know, preparation, preparedness actually being the key there. 
So I started to get prepared because the way that the quarantine is affecting my artists, in addition to the the more understandable surface level concerns of all the world's major music festivals being canceled and all tours being canceled and not being able to play shows, the very, very obvious things about the music industry, let's focus on, that will mean quarantine is affecting my artists to other things that are maybe subsurface to people who are enjoyers of music, but not themselves in bands, things like not being able to have band practice all the way up to and including things like the streaming of live music being profoundly difficult. Like it's difficult for the Grammys to get good sound on the broadcast for their live performances. It's not just the kind of thing where a musician can plug into Instagram and turn their guitar on and just start playing. So knowing that the quarantine was going to affect people in terms of what they had available, what they were able to do in terms of mobility, the kinds of things, like knowing a combination of what's physically possible under quarantine and what people and artists tend to think is possible based on our regular, like, it is the way it is kind of conception of how society and how the music industry works. I sort of started to, and this is the third part of your question, work out magical answers to these problems. And so it's kind of all three is one big answer. All three of your facets to your question, how the quarantine is affecting the artists, how it's affecting my own sense of creativity and how it is affecting my magical practice. Like, yeah, I'm a human being doing this stuff. Two and a half weeks ago, I couldn't focus on an entire page of a book, let alone meditate, because I was freaking out and I wanted to hurl every five seconds. But two and a half weeks into it, and after a lot of coffee and a lot of sitting down, I kind of realized that what's everyone else's new normal, oh my god, we have to figure out a brand new way to live all of a sudden because we're in these spurious conditions, is somebody else's chaos magic. It's, all right, drop of a hat, you put something down, you pick something new up, better be able to do it. And I said, okay. So I immediately tried to figure out a way to stack that deck in our favor. I took my magical practice and I dedicated myself in the hours I wasn't explicitly on email to just sitting and thinking and thinking and clearing my head, trying to use the background knowledge of software combined with some elixir of loud guitars to the power of compassion and just start moving shit wherever I could. And there I stay. So to wit... I hope to continue down this road, but the most satisfying part about it, just if there can be something satisfying about work that's done walled up in your tower during a pandemic, is that it's self-replicating in a way that you and I have talked about before on our TCI interview, how like you start to make connections and then the one spirit calls the other two spirits. So it is bringing people in. It's showing that even if the infection numbers of COVID-19 aren't curving or flattening after a month, the emotional distress that was represented in the data of artists who like don't know what to do is fading because you can see people are on my world and kickstarter they're starting to run projects and they're doing really well out in the world you see people online finally a few weeks in getting the hang of the technology available to them and suddenly all our friends are doing live streams the earths may have been scorched for the time being but with a little outside the box thinking Even people who are really, really suffering creatively from what's going on right now can, to some extent, turn it around for even if for no reason other than to feel better, you know, to do something and to kind of take your mind off things for a while, not necessarily to like be productive and use this time wisely, because that's nonsense, right? But as we start seeing culture as a whole, asking these huge questions about how to modify their lifestyle and their practices, their artistic practices, their daily ritual practices, not in a magic context, like the normal people stuff normal people do every day who don't have broken wizard brains, it might be on those of us who do have those wizard brains to kind of say, oh, yeah, we've been here before. We've had to change up before. We've been walled up in towers before. We've had to radically shift our mindsets and start building whole worlds inside our heads before. We can breathe a little easier knowing a lot of this, even if only in an abstract way, isn't that foreign to us. So trying to repopulate those ideas, trying to work with those ideas up here in my own world and just using those ideas to try and find more ways to help people, largely inspired by you and lots of our other friends. That's kind of been the way that I've been going about things. Maybe it it sounds a little bonkers, but... It's working. And now, you know, a day after the the holy feast days, the three days of the writing of the book of the law, I will ride this out. I will let success be my proof. And success in this case is my friends doing better. And that's that's the only magic I give a shit about anyway. (laughs) 
your excellent point about during times of crisis, during times of, of, of challenge or upheaval, traditionally, it has been going to, you know, the shaman at the edge of the village, the witch, you know, over the cauldron for specific things, and a cult literally having that hidden capacity revealing itself in times of trial. And then in addition to that, and I'd love for you to share with the listeners about this, Meredith, is something you touched on, which is because people's worlds have gotten physically smaller, physically smaller during quarantine, and because there might be esotericists, magicians, artists, creators listening to this, you know, finding ways, as you mentioned, to kind of navigate that, there are so many people who might be sitting there and they're bombarded with... You know, this constant digital stream of follow this path, follow that path. You should be doing this. You should be doing that. And one of the things we were talking about before we hit record was before you do any of that, you need to be able to define occultism and magic. And you you had a really good analogy about different sections in the library. Can you share with the listeners a little bit a little bit more about that? Yeah, yeah, let's talk our shit, because here we are, back here again in the conversation that we've had so many times, which is really, as as you and I know, and as I'm sure a lot of people know, and I preface it thus because I know a lot of people are thinking about this if we are old and, like, concerned for, for the youth, whoever, you can be 70 and be a youth if you're youthful to the topic, how to make sure people are getting the good stuff, how to make sure people are are getting the right information and not either falling into the gulches of the internet or being totally confused and thrown or turned off or in some senses being made to feel like their thing has to look a certain way or that even you have to have a certain level of understanding of a specific kind of material before you start and These paradoxes may become more evident than ever as more people are kind of staying home and we have more free time. And as we have discussed, in my mind, there is a percentage out there in the total group of people who might see some media or have a cool ant with tarot cards or whatever the case may be that makes you interested in magic, right? Of all those people, a percentage of them have the, let's say, power to have knowledge and conversation of whatever the hell they want and they're going to come up to be amazing. But They haven't even started yet, but we know they're there. So how do we make sure that those people aren't, you know, because people are people and we're all going to come from a diversity of backgrounds. People aren't just turned willy nilly into the Internet and told to find the information for themselves, which is usually what you're told to do when you get started. But really, that, like so many things in the world that we operate in, is a little more occluded (laughs) a phrase. Go find out for yourself. That applies kind of more to our ongoing conversation about, no, you actually have to try it. You can't just read about it. Go find out for yourself. Unless, like, I refuse to recommend a book for you because you're whatever, so go find out for yourself. The former is crucial and and interesting and actually leads to great growth on everyone's part. The latter is very herbaceous, and we do not appreciate and love that behavior in this household. And so we are trying to do away with it, because if people are interested in exploring these topics, and they are, they deserve to have a good, fun, nurturing, supportive time while also figuring it out for themselves. And what you and I talked about with regard to this is, you know, I'm a glitch bottle patron. I pay my $7 a month. I get to ask questions of brilliant people like Aiden Walker and Josephine McCarthy. I pester who I want. I'm a paying member. And so <laughs> you get the questions just like I do. And I get the questions. I do a lot of fun stuff on my Instagram story because I'm a huge research nerd. I'm always showing people what I'm reading and what I'm thinking about and instances of like traditional craft popping up in high fashion or writing about shit for Fangoria or whatever. And I'm doing this a lot of the time because it is the delight of my life and I love to share it with people might as well. So I get questions constantly and the general range, and this is what we've talked about, is like, I'm a beginner. What book should I get? Is really common. And then I'm really interested in this, but I don't know where to start, which usually comes with an exhibit. If that's 2A, 2B is, and I got overwhelmed and gave up already. And so these are the people that I'm aware exist. And I, I, the answer that I want to give them is an answer I'd feel safe giving people who, if they just parsed out the question, it could be like a cool first step for them, but which is actually really hard to communicate, especially over the internet when you can't like lay eyes on a person and actually have a real conversation. It's difficult to give this advice when people say like, you know, which book should I start with? And the real question there is, 
uh, like I want to do magic, what book should I start with is I want to do magic. Consider a range of other questions you could follow that with. Are you asking the right first question? Because what we don't think about consciously when we're kind of running on adrenaline and thinking about stuff that gets us all hot and bothered, like the rare manuscripts, is like if, if in your head, like here's where it's got to be broken down, right? So let's say way before this, this person who's asking the question, their concept of magic actually comes from when you close your eyes and try to find the source origin, the fairy godmother in Disney Cinderella. That's actually what's going on in their head when they think magic. And so really, you can suss that out and say, oh, you're doing high dramatic ritual after like a good 10 minutes of conversation. And you say, OK, cool. You should start looking into the history of kinetics in magic. I could suggest five things to that person from, you know, the LBRP and like. Everybody talks about memorizing all the correct verbiage for the LBRP, but like, when is the last time a choreographer went in and did a stock and trade account of the motions? <laughs> you know, it could be something like that. It could be the history of yoga asana and the malformed trip it took to get to the West and end up in its current mutated, you know, yoga pants form. There are so many routes to go down. So if your mind actually sees magic 10 degrees removed as the bibbity bobbity boo from Cinderella waving the wand and having sparkles come out, well, maybe your magic isn't, which book should I get first? Maybe it's, I did ballet when I was a kid. This makes sense. And before you know it, you're learning more from being in the studio than you ever could from a book. But with books, as we've discussed, there is actually a fabulous way to explain in a good sense this explanation of magic and the occult that we're trying to achieve. And so your statement of like, I suggest people get a handle on their definition of magic and the occult, not quite. I suggest people get an understanding of how those terms actually interplay in language, because the way that we came up on this the other day, Alexander, that I thought was smart was like, the occult and magic are akin to like, science, or language or writing and really what they are or like the way we drew it out fiction non-fiction science fiction the occult and magic are the sections in the library that you find the labels on the ends of the shelves you know to then go into the shelves and search by topic to figure out what you actually want to know about because really to wit no one who's asking the question i really want to do magic where do i start only knows the exact limits of the word magic and nothing else about it. If they're interested in starting, they have a preconceived notion about what magic or witchcraft or occultism or whatever the case may be, what that is. And really, they're trying to say, hey, I think something about what you do that I see you do and on the internet could help me achieve this thing that I have depicted in my head. So the question is not what book should I get first? It's how to get what's in your head out into the world. Asking people to ask better, stranger, more uncanny questions is what I want to tell people who ask me for a book recommendation, especially if they're scared as the follow up, if they've already tried to do this and they found it really intimidating, because what that tells me is that, you know, a surface level scouring by someone who's never gone and like dug for it before. If you go on the Googles and you just search like, give me a witch book, who knows what you could end up with? And if you feel intimidated and turned off by some of it, and, you know, we're talking about people who know some stuff and are really getting into it, you know, who aren't necessarily going yet to be searching for a specific passage in the key of Solomon. We're not there yet, but they might know enough to search for, you know, which history. You know, someone could maybe even, let's say, have an idea of like, oh, scrying crystals and then one wrong click lands them in like put a rose quartz up your butt territory. And we don't want that to happen. So like asking this is where we're going to come back into into other conversations we've had about like using project development and systems development as a means to kind of hermetically seal, you know, in a healthcare sense, your magic to keep it safe, to keep it sterile knowing because you've worked back in your own head to wherever it was your idea of magic came from. If you start there at the beginning, you also see the end of things because it tells you where you'd like to end up, or at least it gives you a rough sense of the map. So asking people to ask better questions and work backwards, that's a really crucial part of all of this. 
it will strengthen your intuition. So if you do start getting steered into Rose Quartz in the behind territory, <laughs> if you know why you're here, you'll quickly go, no, I like demons and I'm clicking out of this tab now. I don't want these crystals. No, thank you. I will simply say no, thank you. Um, <laughs> it will let you like hone your intuition to the point where without the inclusion of voices from the community writ large, smart as so many people are, you can actually start you go to the library in your your head, you know, you go to the occult and magic section, you start digging around and suddenly you realize you were interested in the first place because you already have a sense of what magic is and there's your inner compass, right? So asking better questions, which is something that it's not what you usually get per our earlier conversations when you think what's a foundational practice to start with when you're interested in magic and witchcraft, right? You get first practice visualizing for 10 seconds a day you look at a candle then you close your eyes you make it stay there or like the breathwork practices those are foundational fucking practices excuse my french they're really crucial but you got to have a base structure for that and so much of the time there's either an introduction to the book that you missed or maybe background knowledge that not everybody has that you need or merely a foundational sense of security that no book would tell you you need before you sit down to like practice breathing and if you don't have everything you need and you don't know you don't have everything you need, you might end your first magical experience, even if it's just sitting and visualizing an apple for five minutes, kind of tweaked out and wondering if you've made mistakes or at least feeling open ended and not like confident, okay, I can go forward with this. And so I really think that for the real answer that I would give to people, you know, because sometimes I will tell people that they have to go eat three frogs during a certain moon phase, like if I really, <laughs> I'm capable of all sorts of tricks. But if people really wanted to think critically, and in my head, make a first step that wouldn't require asking many more questions of other people, especially colossal herbs like me, my first step wouldn't be anything close to like, sitting and trying to do magic, it would be like, recognizing that you don't need to add anything, you need to take stock of what you already have your understanding of what magic actually is, and then recalculate, is this why you want to do it? Okay, you'll start to lock into some keywords, your Google searches are going to get a lot tighter, you're going to start stumbling into the right sources, resources, forums, things like that. But yeah, my explicit belief, working belief anyway, at this point, is that an understanding of innate belief that as in like how the human mind comes up with our individual truths, not belief like a religious or theological belief or a belief in, you know, the Olympic spirits or what have you, but belief like how we come to be able to assert that we know things. We think it's enough to be able to explain the historical systems. You know, I am a thelemite because historically these things happened that led to this book. And prior to that, here's where this draws from all the way back to like, no, 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 not that. Actually understanding the roots of how belief itself is possible as an act is like, the 101 that I think a lot of people could start with to really, really strong effect, not jumping in feet first and trying to figure out how magic works in all caps, because again, magic is the section. It's not what you're going to end up doing very specifically. Masonry applies, build yourself a very strong base structure. <laughs> and that might not happen through a witch book. That might happen through anything from neuro-linguistic programming to Alan Watts to you know, getting conked on the head real hard by something falling out of a tree. You never know what'll cause it. But critical thinking prior to magic, I would say. That's actually the biggest thing that I've been thinking about lately in terms of what's a reasonable place to start for especially people who are new or sort of new, who really are compelled to start figuring out what it is they like about magic and occultism on their own. Yeah, honestly, Alexander, I probably could have TLDR'd this by saying, yeah, if a person really wants to get into magic and occultism on their own, high likelihood to the tune of 101% chance they're actually already doing it, which is why they're asking the question in the first place, and it's not a book they need, it's encouragement. That might be the actual answer for me in like a simultaneously oversimplified and wildly verbose <laughs> sense, <laughs> if that makes sense. Absolutely. And I really hope the listeners benefit from this as much as I am. And, and this actually, Meredith, leads to something you touched on, which is the kinetics of practice effectively at any time, but especially during the COVID-19 pandemic in terms of like looking at online forums, resources, online chatter, etc. There are two broad categories that I'm kind of seeing magicians 
engage in, or people who are at least interested in esotericism engage in. And one group would be people who have a process, which is great, saying basically, I'm not bored or challenged at all during the COVID-19 quarantine. Now I have more time to engage in magical work, which is awesome. And then there is the opposite side of the spectrum I'm seeing, which is that quarantine tends to effectively increase the arm chairing and the, you know, oh, I'll just do research, which is great. Don't get me wrong, but I'll only armchair things and I'll only do research. And then in the future, once this COVID-19 pandemic kind of goes away, quote unquote, 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 then I can actually start practicing. So between these two kind of opposite sides of the spectrum, it might be a false dichotomy. It might not. But can you, Meredith, talk about your process and how you use your own kinetics esoterically to overcome being tempted to armchair things to death and just spend time online doing research and then actually having that process. My kinetic witchcraft right now is doing a little marimba dance at my laptop screen while we're talking because you know this is my favorite topic. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, I do. (laughs) Oh, the armchair magician, saith the desk chair magician. In the gap in the spectrum that lies between those two points is me with both my middle fingers raised in a bikini on a skateboard, smoking three cigarettes at the same time, waving an entire deck of tarot cards that is just all the devil, just 70 something devil cards, right? Because fuck that. You know, that drives me nuts. So this is exactly what we were talking about, right? Armchair magician. I love that phrase. I love it. I think it's hysterical. It's like perfect, right? It's it's the magical equivalent to me of calling someone like a basement dweller. It's really good. Just rich with imagery. But if you're young and you're like armchair magician, oh my God, that's one of those terms that's really going to make people, all people flat, right? Feel, oh shit, can't be that, right? Don't want to be that. Don't want to be the the funny word. You don't want to be like the poser, basically, right? Because armchair magician is kind of a way of saying poser, punk is everywhere. So I also think that in the fish don't know water because they're swimming in it context, again, the people who use that term are largely themselves desk chair magicians, which is to say privileged enough to view reading and research as a bad thing. And you know, this is a passion point of mine, sir, which is that young magicians who are really interested in reading and research, possibly they're in the mental library that I was just describing, right? There is a massive difference between gluing your ass to the lazy boy when you could be out doing whatever manner of highfalutin thing that you claim to be excellent at in your like newsletter or whatever. And as I view it for so many people, canonically and non canonically, I'll dig back into that. What is quote unquote armchair work to occultists who come from marginal backgrounds for whom literacy has been denied historically, for whom access to universities and areas of study have been denied historically? What's armchair magician about what basically amounts to cultural ancestor veneration if you're the first person or you're the person who's going in and say, mending a historical wrong by researching until you're able to write corrective text or sitting and reading every single thing you can about a subject that was forbidden to you, whether through any of the prior conceits or just prior to now. For so many people, hint, hint, not the people, the way they look, the social classes they fit into, who generally have the extreme privilege of being able to publish occult literature, For so many of us, there is no such thing as being an armchair magician. We've been on our feet working magicians for however long, being in the positions that we're in or stuck on the outskirts of society wherever, to have the extraordinary privilege of being an armchair magician. I believe it is reparative work, and I actually believe it's some of the strongest magical reparative work any people with their nuts together could be doing during something like this quarantine, because... You know, you can write this on the matchbox my ashes will fit in when they come for me for saying it. But the people who need to hear this most of all are the people who think they are the most well-read. Because then you have to come up against the limits of what was published. And you have to face that truth down and consider in another way how your personal practice may have excluded people on the margins for whom literacy and publishing, amongst many other things have never been and still aren't like really common in the world of occult literature and scholarship. So on the subject of armchair magicians, 
my ass feels fantastic. I just want you to know that. And I'm doing magic all the time. That's actually part of the kinetics, especially because if we're members of certain social groups that are like you and I are in a way, though incredibly different ways, still working in some context on the front lines of this crisis, who are really, really stressed. If I spend an entire day furiously trying to help artists raise money to pay their rent, at the end of the day, if I sit down with Gia Sophia, I'm not an armchair magician, I'm just doing magic, I'm just sitting down with the rare manuscripts, right? There's something to be said for the language of armchair magicianship as also being ableist that really pisses me off, right? But then there's this whole other thing of discouragement, and that's really what we're here to talk about. And so, given the amount of trauma and like PTSD level symptoms a lot of people are experiencing under quarantine, adjusting, which is like LOL scare quotes, we're not adjusting to this new normal, catching up historically to things that haven't always been available to us. There is a kinetics of armchair magic, and it is called the radical necessity of rest in a society that would prefer you do literally anything but. So just starting there, <laughs> huge suggestion, armchair magicianship, sit your ass down and read, take your mind off things for a while, write some notes about it. You are going to come out looking a lot better shape than people who are bored right now under quarantine because they think they've done every magical thing there is to do. So there is that, that I do, I believe firmly that armchair magicianship is a form of, of kinetic bliss that is unparalleled. But beyond that, kinetics of magic in quarantine are really great because of the inverse, which is my number one favorite argument for anything. This is going to be an amazing time for a lot of people who are working on a kind of kinetics that most of us don't have prior access to before we start doing magic, which is the kinetics of the interior, working on things like not just visualizing, but I'm talking all the way up to and including conceits like the great voice. Maybe you're quarantined with people and that's actually what's fucking your magic up right now, right? Like you can't loudly do your Orphic hymns at four in the morning on your fire escape without your neighbor throwing eggs at you, right? So what are you going to do about it? A lot of people, you know, maybe people have done choreography or martial arts or something, something that will allow them to do like hand gestures without falling over, right? But not many people have practiced yelling in their own head. So there is an internal kinetics that I think could be something that would be really fantastically interesting for a lot of people now. Not visualizing, because even the popularity of that term really tells us how focused we are on like a pretty limited sensorial set when historically, you know, in the group, let's just take, you know, Goetia demonology stuff, for example, like we stress visualizing, visualizing, visualizing in modern magic. And then meanwhile, you read historical texts and it's like the demon was there. And I know because I smelled him, <laughs> you know, like visualize my ass. He stinks. Right. So like it's not just visualizing keying into your personal set of kinetics is sort of like another rudimentary thing I would always suggest people do in addition to like asking the foundational questions of what your understanding of magic is. And then from there, and it's not like a, the next level or a level up, it's just like a cool sidestep. It's a good dance move anyway, to ask yourself how you experience it. Because before you, you know, focusing, visualizing, great, okay, cool. But like, what if I physically feel things? Like, what if I know angels are in my house because I have ASMR, you know, <laughs> stuff like that. So parsing out your understanding of magic, which will thus help you get to understand the kind of magic that you want to do. And then also parsing how you're actually like, not just how you'll know it worked, but the measurement styles that you're actually going to use along the way. These are really important foundational steps. And you don't have to open a book to know these things. But there should probably be more books that spell them out. I'll say that. Because I feel like, I don't know. What do you think? I feel like this stuff is important. This is foundational, right? Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, I'm you... Like you nuts for positing, sit down and have a good think about your feelings. And that's like actually a much stronger first step to understand. Like, what am I going to do? Stick the lesser key in some 14-year-old kid's hand and say, go forth and thrash? Like, no, I'm going to ask you to think about what the world means to you. Magic is ostensibly whatever you want to change about it or you. So, right? Like, am I nuts or why not start there? I totally agree. And I think you talk about magical reparative work and kind of this, you know, radical necessity of getting rest. And this kind of goes to internal kinetics, which is that so many people out there want, of course, to practice effective magic and esotericism. But so many people are kind of maybe afraid or apprehensive, cautious, like whatever the right word is, to go beyond what is written and it kind of goes to the heart of the word occult itself and so i guess the question would be for people who find themselves in quarantine 
they're just standing in a fire hose of information from the internet about esotericism and magic and this is the path that's it follow this path and you will get what you desire etc how do you go beyond that and actually truly bathe in this kind of mystery that is at the heart of the occult which is most of the learning and most of the teaching is way beyond the books it's beyond the online forums what kind of advice would you have for for people who find themselves in quarantine and who are like i want to go beyond but i i might not know how absolutely so the cool thing about that is that yet again we have to pull out and take a view of what is actually being said or asked in that exact moment I want to do this, but I can't yet because I haven't done the research, right? Or like the research scares me. So I want to do this, but I haven't done the work or I haven't done the research or the research scares me. So I can't, right? Is one of those weird moments where I tend to look at people when they say stuff to me, I'm like factually correct because it is. You want to do the work, but because you're scared of it or because you haven't read enough about it, you can't. There are delineated requirements for preparedness before every magical act. This is something that once you take the first step to taking care of your own question, if you're the asker in this case, you're going to start to figure out very, very, very quickly. All you're going to have to do is start, right? And my advice to these people would be start because, again, if the argument is I want to do magic, but I haven't read these books and they scare me, so I can't, right? functionally true you don't even know the magic in the book you couldn't possibly mess it up if you tried you haven't even clicked a single button yet we're not there (laughs) right the way that you start thus is figuring out you have to have that and this is a great place this is where you get to remind people that they actually are permitted to be excited now rather than terrified because this is the most like wonderful blessed moment that a person can possibly find themselves in it is the virgin presentation to the art right? Like you say, congratulations. Holy fuck. I wish I was still back in your shoes instead of this grizzled old miserable crone who can't get through a board meeting without bringing up Paracelsus, right? Like, welcome, baby. (laughs) Welcome, baby. Unfurl your bat wings. We're all terrified here. So that would be my advice to those people. It's like, you're absolutely right. Knowledge is preparedness. It's not chill vibes and conversation of the holy guardian angel motherfucker, right? Like, knowledge. So again, pro armchair magician me. If you feel like you're intimidated by the fact that you haven't read anything, you haven't figured it out, we'll start reading and see if that instantly makes it become less intimidating. You have to know what you're going to do with your circle. You got to have your incantations memorized or you got to know which books you got to bring into the thing with you, knowing that at the highest level on the opposite end of the spectrum, you got to be totally prepared before you get into that shit. You work backwards from the woodcuts of D or whatever, and you figure out, oh, at some point, this house that he's in had to be built. You know, everybody starts somewhere. And so... Just like the horror stories, true and otherwise, of people who walk into this stuff blind and just start dicking around, you have a right to be scared. You congratulate the person who says those things like, I don't know where to begin and I'm a little intimidated. Say, good, Jack Parsons should have had your attitude, right? (laughs) Before becoming human corned beef hash, you have to be a little fucking precious and careful with your energy. And you should want to be. You should celebrate yourself for being trepidatious, especially if that reserve comes from... And understanding based on lived experience, i.e., the real argument is I want to start doing magic, but I look around all the time and I see white dudes with surfer hair and I can't get into it. Like, that's a real concern. I think there are so many people out there who want to do magic right now who have already come up against societal conditions and life under capitalism. It's so fucking terrifying. They're much less worried about demons than they are about casual MRA stuff in the bro occultist videos they find on YouTube. Like... We have talked about this a lot before, right? Grimoire traditionalism versus asinine purism. And so if you go digging into the internet and you fall into those worlds, you know, at any point when you start, you know, we haven't touched on this true darkness yet, but you can't get that far into the internet of occultism before you find some really, truly upsetting and terrible shit by people who have absolutely no idea what they're talking about, but they're linking the mysteries with, you know, horny viking cosplay that looks like it was drawn by tom of finland a bunch of greased up white supremacists doing push-ups and taking pictures of each other with fake rune tattoos for instagram or whatever hellhole you find yourself in at any given time that's either going to make you say oh this is occultism this isn't what i want to do or oh this is occultism these people are going to murder me i'm out of here 
So <laughs> to wit, knowledge is preparedness. You will feel better about doing literally any action in this world or any other if you just set yourself up to know what you're in for and pre-roll. And in the world of magic, this can be anything from like... If your idea of magic, per like the first step we elucidated of what what is your sense of magic? Okay, you saw some woodcuts, so you, we're doing the Trithemian. We're getting our crystals out and we're shining them up well, and we're going to look for some angels, and we want to do that. You know, you have to know so much. That's a form of preparedness. If your idea of magic is bent on activism, community justice, social healing, then you're going to want to know about who these douchebags are. You're going to have to do the research. Knowledge is preparedness. You're going to have to watch the most potent and toxic of YouTube channels. You're going to have to have like a barf bag on hand while you read about these absolute panty waste British folk musicians out there playing at jihad, calling it Satanism, like... The garbage runs super deep. But whether you're talking about being afraid of the absolute, like, hemorrhoids of occultism or simply being afraid of the grandiosity of it all, literally knowledge is preparedness. And now we're back to kinetics and why I actually think armchair magicianship is kineticism, because being a survivalist <laughs> in an ESO or exoteric sense can't just be about, you know, having the proper tools on hand. You actually have to know your environment, your surroundings, and be able to delineate between the map and the terrain. So it's a lot of kinds of preparedness. It's not just, you know, to lean on your favorite example of any magic ever, lighting the appropriate incense at the correct planetary hour. It's not just that, but <laughs> it's also like cultural preparedness. It's sociocultural preparedness. It's research preparedness. It's personal and emotional preparedness. It's health. There is a lot that can be said about how to conquer fear, but the only summary that will actually have, if any, meaningful impact is just do. I'm totally going to mess up this quote from our mutual colleague, Sam Block. So, Sam, please forgive me. But, you know, when Sam was on the podcast, he said effectively that, you know, people are so obsessed with wanting to succeed and succeed. And he's like, no, the secret is to to learn to fail and to fail better effectively. And I would say people are obsessed with surviving. Not the same, because the operative definition of success that can actually be said to be universal across the board is like what we call basic human rights and like not dying, right? We're obsessed with learning how to survive and whether or not we have to code switch and call it success in daylight hours is, you know, kind of past the point we're trying to make in the immediate. But because of that, and because we are so ensconced in that survival mindset, and I completely agree with Sam Block, yeah, I, I precisely like spot on, I would reorient that a little more towards survival because we are so obsessed with trying to survive, which forces us to weigh ourselves constantly against a metric that's absolutely terrifying. I think it skews our sense of metrics in the first place. So this, again, is like people are so obsessed with the need for survival that they've allowed it to skew their definition of success. And then people are so obsessed with success that it's you know going to stop them from doing anything at all or it's going to skew their work a certain way. I take that back a step further in like what we call success now, I think in so many capacities would literally just be basic human rights and decency that it's kind of and probably purposefully engineered by, you know, the, the dominant culture at large. It's very much resulted in why so many sociologists and cultural theorists outside the strictly occult disciplines are calling for a return to enchantment, you know, like. It's the success, the definition of success comes not from each to each. It comes from the necessity of survival in this like brutal, hateful world. It's not just that we can't measure our magic by that same success metric. It's that we can't make a metric for magical success if all we know is survival cloaked in its language. Is that lunacy? Or does that like, does that make sense? Like the definition of the word success has changed to like, Success, on to the next Pac-Man level, and you can only go on until the ghosts manage to get you. Success, you escaped death, has permeated so much of our lives as individuals that, like, that will throw your magic faster than anything else. Because it'll, it'll keep you dreaming small, amongst other things. Yes, I totally agree. The kind of, you know, bare necessity survivalism that is prevalent and required for the entire human species is a very, very tangible, real thing and it's it's to me i mean it's where if you look at the pgm and you look at some of the earliest forms of ritual magic especially the very practical magic those were the things that they were focused on i mean we always think for example that 
you know, the PGM was this very kind of, you know, oh yes, pyramids and priests and temples. It's like, look at the spells and look at the specific incantations and ritual operations. And they were very much focused on survival, you know, the acquisition of material resources, mm-hmm. um, you know, all so... The way back, all the way back to the golden ass, where the only notable factor of the magic as portrayed was that it, like, made his weenie bigger. Like, the dude is literally... I took the flying ointment that was rubbed on my hands by the sorceress and everything was unremarkable, except I was itchy and I had a big penis. Like, that's grease for you. For me, then they're meaning fucking depictions of ancient magic, you know? For people who are, 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 as you mentioned, finding their path and kind of defining it, one of the things that could be, and I'd love your thoughts on this in terms of it being a roadblock, I should have said when I said success, is this kind of lust for results, so mm-hmm. to speak, where people open a book or they start a practice or they're in an initiatory tradition. And they almost, and I think this is what Sam was getting to, is that there might be kind of a mental apprehension of, if I don't do the ritual or do the thing exactly how it was written about or you know orally transmitted about in the most outrageous and perfect and whatever way and i didn't experience that in the ritual that i just got done doing well i must be failing and i must not be doing it right and maybe there's another tradition or maybe there's another thing you know and instead of the opposite which would be sticking with it and it's something josephine mccarthy and aiden walker and other people talk about like and i love your thoughts on this meredith like have you ever been in, and can you share with the listeners about times esoterically, otherwise, where you might have been faced with that, too, where you said, okay, here's something I'm pursuing, here's something that I'm really interested in, but I maybe didn't have the outcome that I thought I wanted, and instead of choosing to, like, leave it and say, well, that's not for me, you stuck with it. Am I like the occult NFL coach right now that has to give the really meaningful, inspiring story? Or do I discuss when my first major pay-in to martial spirits resulted in me getting my ass beat sideways for like a solid three months before I figured out my terrible clerical error? (laughs) Holy crap. Both of those sound like Hollywood movies, but please go on. We all have lots of these stories. Where I've gotten in over my head... Okay, I want to walk this back again, because there have been so many times functionally, okay, the martial spirits story of me, like, absolutely, like, it was a piano on the head when I realized what I'd done, and it took entirely too long. That, (laughs) this is, this is my story, and I'm keeping it to myself. Beyond that, I don't know if I've said this to you before, but knowledge is preparedness. (laughs) Um... When you are worried about something, when you feel like you're over your depth, and specifically when it comes to this, because in addition to the very kind way you phrased it about, like, what if I don't feel totally prepared? I feel like I need to do the thing on the page exactly how it's written. You know, you and I have had these conversations before, and we tend to throw the Abermalin around real heavy here. Like, okay, I'm looking at the Abermalin. Like, the Abermalin is always the example, right? Looking at the Abermalin, and I'm going to have to do exactly what it says on the page. And then I have to be really, 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 really careful not to mess it up. And then what you'll do maybe is you'll do a little bit of digging and you'll see people saying, you know, there'll be some argument about whether or not a person is putting themselves in grave, grave danger by doing the abermalin with an LED candle or something like that. And the crux of the fight will be like purity in terms of the text. This is what I mean by knowledge is power. Even if you've read all the grimoires, even if you've read other grimoires from the same era, and you can say, well, there's this other book here where you're more focused on this act of conjuration, and you're not even worried about the candles, because you maybe you do this one outside, or not even that. You need to know other things, three disciplines removed from what you're doing, because really, what would help you there is putting down the Abermalin. And picking up a book that talked about the way magic was done in the time period that you're looking at when the Avermanon was popular. Or look at the grimoire in your hand is not the grimoire that's been worked by people who've also held that book, right? There are always going to be discrepancies. There will always be modifications. And this is positing. We're talking as if these books were published by known authors at a certain date, right? Oftentimes, if you're just starting out, you don't know this, learning how to figure out how the manuscript system works and what translation of what book you're holding and what it actually came from, sometimes being some like massively ancient thing that's locked away somewhere in a university or a museum that's actually, when they found it, let's say on the site, it's somebody's folder. And so you'll see all the pages in the Stephen Skinner version, but really it's like three books in one book. And if you're like new at this, 
that's not gonna cross your mind right you're so overwhelmed with excitement to hang out with some demons you are not going to be thinking about the history of publication and the fact that like a lot of these grimoires that we look at as complete systems they're complete systems based on literal physical archaeological carbon-based artifacts aka huge chunks of them physically disintegrated what is your complete system and where did you get this idea right so the first step i would have for those people again would be knowledge become informed if you're confused by what's literally in the grimoire find a book about a magician who used that particular grimoire if you are doing the abermalin in fact i would really recommend uh what is it called the magician's diary i'm trying to look across my room at my bookshelf i don't have my glasses on there's a great first person memoir that originally was published i think in the 80s william somebody originally he published it under a pseudonym and then like 10 years later he did a re-upped version which is his actual diary is like a guy in the 70s who's doing the abermalin and a t- it's a short book and a ton of it's about how mad his wife was the entire time but you read enough books like that and it really shocks you out of your senses in terms of the worry of doing it wrong like Honestly, I can walk myself back from that and say, if you read the grimoires closely and you just read the grimoires and avoid the argumentative discourse around them happening on social media in one context, you're actually going to find really quickly that, especially if you're taking a compassionate view towards this, as in, I just want to do it right. I just want to like get good results and not hurt myself, not hurt anybody. That's all there in the text. Abermalin is like, you're going to have to do all these things, you're going to have to fast, you're going to have to pray, and you're going to have to withdraw increasingly from society. But there's whole parts in it that are like, we understand if you have to go to your job for like most of it, like just do your best. Don't have sex with your wife unless you were already trying to make a baby. That's in there. You know, do what you can is in there a lot. Like there are explicit modifications in the text of the Abermalin that are like, do this to the best of your ability. Like the sunrise part is important. But when we say like retreat from society, we understand if you have to work. Whenever that was actually written, it was in there. Right. So like either uh, a dedicated close reading of the grimoire itself minus exterior voices and arguments will generally find even if only in the magician's own narrative style, so you kind of have to look just below the surface, which parts they were unsure of when they were writing it. like, And then something is going to happen, or like partial spells or, or carbon decay. And then on the other hand, study the history of how these books were used. And in a lot of cases, you very quickly see how all the loudest people in the argument might be a little bit off in like their misuse of things. But really, it will just give you a context for other ways other people have done it and how many ways there are. So yeah, I love to have the the grand images and the grand metaphors, but it's the monad, right? There's the point and then the circle around it that is the line, right? You can either look at it from the middle of the circle or the edge of the circle in. If you're in the middle of the circle looking out, you're there, you're doing the magic, you're looking at the results based on what you've come up with out of what's in the book. If you're on the edge of the circle looking in, you're in the perspective of historical precedent, tracking to you yourself in the center how you got to now. And so really, like my answer to very much everything, including the largest question of all, which is what should people be doing with their magical time under quarantine, is making their internal models of magic more dimensional, however you can, because it's that it's if you feel like you know everything, in a lot of cases, (laughs) the the thing that I want to say when I'm being, oh, you think you know everything about this one tradition? Well, what about women? You know, that's like often my answer to this stuff, you know, like, oh, can you tell me anything about the women who were part of it? No? Okay. Can, what, what about? Okay, cool. Read firsthand documents, find diaries, find historical record, find later, you know, comprehensive academic analysis. Even if it doesn't get you the 50% improved, you know, net results the next time <laughs> you're in the circle, I bet you are never going to say, hey, I really want to do this, but I don't feel informed enough ever again. And then you got to like check that back against the intention of the thing in the first place, because if the magic that you wanted to do was to become a smarter and better magician, well, buddy, you did. (laughs) That's how I feel about the importance of research for like an hour straight. So, yeah, stand in the middle of the circle and stare out and then walk to the periphery of history of knowledge. And hint, hint, you don't actually like you can set your circle. But in terms of knowledge, you do not know where the periphery is. Go walking. That's such a great point. And in terms of the periphery and knowing where the kind of bleeding edge is, 
I don't know if you've mentioned this before, but knowledge is preparedness, as I think I heard a very wise person once say. Some bitch, yeah. And, and, well, and as the director of music at Kickstarter, and as a magician, and as someone who is very involved in helping artists and creators, and kind of at the intersection of, or in the center of the circle of technology and communication and esotericism, what I'm wondering is, across the entire world, every industry every you know with personal conversations whatever it is people are are constantly saying that COVID-19 and the pandemic is going to change things it's going to change how healthcare is delivered it's going to change how industry operates i guess what i'm wondering is where you sit from a personal level as as a magician and an esotericist and also as someone who is constantly trying to help and connect artists and creators and find sustainable projects is it too early to tell, or or is this pandemic going to kind of forever change both how magic is approached, either digitally or personally, and also how artists approach kind of getting projects, you know, looked at and supported? Or is it too early to tell in your In a way, it has made us ever more aware of pre-existing cultural pandemics, i.e. the pandemic of no one having fucking health care and stuff like that. In music, specifically the industry I work in predominantly, this is elucidated for us the pandemic of how if you take away touring, which musicians were already so desperate and under-resourced with streaming music, literally absolutely taking money for playing music online off the table effectively for most musicians. And then you take touring out of that too. You take all of that stuff out. It's already like radically, radically changed the world for musicians as much as it possibly could have, while also, again, bringing to light just how awful and how fetid the situation in the music industry was before, where the only way most artists on the like normative touring circuits can make money is to get a little money first, tour, play shows, maybe make a little money to go to the next show and like sell merch. And all of that is predicated around being in a van together for long periods of time, crowds every night, sweaty, blah, blah, blah. Like, it's already changing, right? So all of that has already changed. But it had also been bad before. So in music, anyway, I am hoping there's a little bit more recognition of that. And so far, it's actually it's being so widely discussed by everybody, but the companies that are causing problems, which can kind of go, oh, we're doing so much to help. But regardless, since that is already changing, The pandemic has already changed stuff for musicians and for people in general, for artists in general. But again, because I you give me a list of three bullet points and I can't address them separately, I I just I start to model them together. And so when the question is one of like as like a person who makes art as like a magician, as a person who like basically eats, sleeps and breathes helping people as I am, how do I see the pandemic changing the world that in my head is only ever going to be a triangle with like magic art and music on the three sides of it. And for the triangle to exist, we just retain balance. I think this is where we could start to like co-create a future silver lining where the pandemic will change artists, musicians and magicians in ways that allow us to more closely emulate one another. I think as you and I have talked about in detail in part of our TCI interview, like the bulk of this didn't make it into the final print, but how we got really literal about the comparisons between evocation and podcasting up to and including like having a disembodied voice in your room. What ascends past that is this idea of conjuration to form, which now is a live stream, right? You just had a physical form of a person appear right in your house. Cool. You know, we're going to start feeding these ideas into each other and going in, not actually being able to physically commune But already what we see is like the way that this pandemic is affecting artists is it's pushing us to have crazy conversations and get real close to each other and just start talking, even if it's kind of a panicked scramble where we're sitting right now. But what's going to happen if you send three, you know, pool balls rocketing towards each other, they're going to collide in the middle and they're going to split back out. And I do see that as being a possible iteration of how the pandemic will change things for magicians, artists and musicians alike. I mean, these aren't separate disciplines implicitly, of course, but they are separate industries because industry creates separation. So like really what I mean to say is shit's about to go weird. And I really hope it does because, you know, Burroughs did cut ups and Burroughs did albums with Sonic Youth. You know, like if there were ever a time for visual artists and performance artists and musicians and magicians to get together and say, not how is this 
pandemic going to change our industries, but like, how can we change under pandemic? How can we use, you know, to make a semi lucid alchemical metaphor out of this, like imagine if all of us being quarantined is kind of like in the crucible with the lid on and we're just being left to putrefy and putrefy and putrefy and putrefy. Like if artists, magicians and musicians are the people who are capable of identifying their place in that process while it's happening, who knows what we could do if we kind of stuck together. And so I see that as being like a loud potential outcome of this. There is something real to do with magic and to do with music and to do with the quarantine. And I think I do not mean this in the same stupid stumping BS way that people said after the last election. Oh, well, at least hardcore is going to be good again. Like, is has it been, motherfucker? No, nah, y'all were wrong. I mean, you were wrong back then. But in that way of people can benefit, musicians, artists, magicians can benefit it's not like, oh, magic will get really powerful again or whatever like the dumb equivalent of that would be. But it's going to be one way we could change in response to pandemic is like from the side of music, for instance, unplugging our major connections now, which were to the bar touring circuit and alcohol companies or streaming or whatever it is. And like maybe now that we can't go do those things, it's almost like it's a pretty literal music metaphor. If you think about it, if your amp is unplugged, if your guitar came unplugged, you can't plug back into the money like the way it was right now. Try running it through a pedal and then try again. And maybe that pedal is ceremonial magic, right? Or maybe it's visual art. Maybe if something is not working, try an interlocutor. And that is something where I think we could see really curious stuff start to come out of this. Even in like the most stupid and simplistic way I could have explained this, which is just like the history of the magical hermitage. People may not be doing it on purpose either. People may just, they may end up making absolutely incredible things through, you know, like I said, we just did the writing of the book of the law. Who's going to channel the next great you know, Hunger Games series while we're all under quarantine. I'm not saying I want to know them, but I know that it could happen. So I'm hoping it does. More interactivity. Ho hopefully, at least a little of the time that we are not trying to survive and save the world, we are pursuing that question itself. How is this going to change us in these disciplines from a different angle and from one that gives us a little bit of agency? What could be more magical than that. And I, I know that you and I have discussed this kind of off the air, and I know it's talking with Sam Block and Josephine McCarthy and, and others, that people are always so obsessed with, in kind of the esoteric world, with, and you've touched on this beautifully in the last 10 minutes, with the process in terms of the physical, okay, I'm going to open this book, and this is a grimoire, and I'm going to do this. But at no point in that process are people talking about to your point, Meredith, the goals, the actual end result. Why am I doing this? Am I doing this to be effectively walking around in theater props while making myself feel better as some kind of like like long-robed therapy? Or are there actual goals at the end of the tunnel? And I love that. Like, What could be more magical? Because to bring up the music industry, exactly, instead of artists lashing themselves to the pillar of effectively a crumbling industry... What could be more magical than organically delving the spade deep into this kind of rich Saturnine soil where it's literally a field of potentiality and whatever grows there is, is perhaps whatever the actions are resulting from, or as you mentioned, bringing up issues that have been latent for decades and decades through the COVID-19 pandemic. I mean, it's very magical time. I mean, talk about the Saturnine fields. The lands have been raised flat. You know, the pandemic has made it difficult to sort of strategize or even envision a life after this. But it's no longer like pile of skulls, image, superimposed text over equality, you know, like right now, everyone is made of meat and everyone is equally vulnerable. Right. And so now we are in a position where at worst, if you're in like the non mainstream music industry, if you're in the touring circuit, then it is not good that the industry is out either, right? So like, I'm mad because I'm in bands, and I want to tour. And I'm also mad because all of my friends who are bartenders and sound guys and who run venues and who do lights and who shoot music videos and all those people are out of work too, right? And that part really breaks my heart every single day of my life a 100 times. But the flip side of that is that maybe not at the digital level, but a lot of really bad people are also out of work right now. And they're less powerful. And so to an extent across the industry now is a moment of great equalizing. 
because people who are in like arbitrary self-appointed positions of authority, great, important like managers, you know, people in that vein of the music world, they were just reduced to absolute zilch with no purpose either. So like, if you are up for it, and that's what I mean by it is truly Saturnine. It is the everybody body of the, the humus of this awful situation. It's like, if you're feeling it, now you can try overturning things, per the metaphor, that never have to be turned back. I may be here in the industry, I'm no expert in exactly what that is going to look like. But man, I'm encouraging people to start figuring that out if you were at all up for it. Because now... Now is the time where somebody could really accidentally on purpose hit on something that undoes the worst of it, partially or in total, for now or ever. So I want to see people, uh, again, like maybe maybe we're bringing it all the way back to here. Like, don't just read what's in there off the page. If you just read what's in, like, you actually can't worry about whether or not you're doing it by the literal fucking book. You know what I mean? When we say do it by the book... (laughs) <laughs> like whether it's a grimoire or your music industry career, there is no way you will literally get anywhere just doing it by the book. Both music and magic have a requirement for improvisation. Even if you are a classical instrument player whose job it is to precisely hit every single note on the sheet music, perhaps your improvisation is in the way you turn your ankles to hold your instrument. You're improvising. It has to be that neutral in magic, too, because in that neutrality is where its power is from. You know, (laughs) you kind of have to have that sense. That is truly overturning a lot of the systems and a lot of the structures and kind of constipated thinking and consciousness that's effectively petrified how people can move forward and have their own idiosyncratic kind of organic practice as opposed to as you just so eloquently said, saying, oh, if it's not exactly like it is in the book, well, it's better just not to do it at all. Yeah, let me stress that, because that actually makes it makes a lot of sense. Like, if you are the person who, from a few questions back, is saying, like, I really want to do this, but I haven't read enough and I'm scared, how many times in your life has reading the manual actually prepared you for the situation, right? And or how many times in your life have you actually read the entire manual before you dug in? Now, this is not an across the board blanket over magic. But like, I'm just saying, how many times in your life have you felt real joy or true success or like you've done something meaningful and memorable just going by the book? And that should tell you everything instinctually about how close of a read you need to be doing in some in some contexts and or Think of all the atrocities in history on the other extreme swing end that have been created when people just blindly go along with the book and then scale that back down to, in some cases, going by the book is going to result in you rubbing cinnamon directly into your eyes. So, like, please no one go by the book ever in magic or, like, when repairing your car or, like, trying to make a career for yourself in the arts. Like, just following the manual as it is laid out is the least fun and most stressful way of going about things. (laughs) <laughs> no, that is that is such a great point. And how, Meredith, can we hermetically seal magic to keep it safe and sterile, not only during the COVID-19 pandemic, but what are some things that, are, you know, tips, advice, wisdom you have for listeners who might need some support in that area about maybe they have a really great magical practice or they really do have kind of a ritualized structure? But given all of the turmoil that's going on right now, what are some protective things that that we can do to hermetically seal the magic? Well, there's a whole variety of stuff here because there's some things that I think are actually pretty functional and some that are pretty preventative, functional in a material sense, and then some in the esoteric sense. And then as usual, I think there's some stuff that's going to apply to both. But like, yeah, we were cackling about that the other day, the idea of like hermetically sealed is never meant so much before, but really explore that. Like, what does that mean in the biomedical context when something is hermetically sealed and scale it all the way back to as above, so below, as within, so without the idea of hermetically sealing your magic is to make sure that it is balanced and balance is where the safety comes in. Right. So this is not necessarily even in the highest of the arts, like making sure you got your corners nailed down correctly. This could really be like making sure you're sure, making sure you are sure before you go into the stuff. So how to be safe in like that hermetically sealed sense, especially right now to me involves a couple different layers 
of protection. And that could be the same as like having a couple different layers of protective clothing on if you're going into a dangerous situation or having both your circle cast and your lamin around your neck for a couple layers of protection while you're doing conjurations, right? So in a practical sense, one of the first things that comes to mind, and I can share this link because it's someone who works here in Brooklyn, I have seen one and several past that herbalists and foragers who are out talking now both about how people who are outside of urban areas like New York City who are in the start of foraging season need to be very genteel with the ecosystems they're destroying, for instance, uh, if they overpick because arguably more people will be doing stuff like that or gardening this year due to the pandemic, right? So it can be for people outside of the city, don't now start to get interested in herbal medicine and go out and start eating things that grow in your yard. For people in the city, there are like rogue botanists who are going around and saying, okay, if you're thinking about going around and foraging during COVID-19, here's what like rubber gloves and cement dust can do to your wild garlic. And I'll send some links to those for people who want to learn a little more. So uh, like practical ways that you can keep your magic safe right now wouldn't be out foraging if you live in cities. And stuff like that, especially because, as we know, through air transmission, like there's all sorts of ways that you could spin this out into tinfoil hat land, but basically be very careful, especially if you're in an urban area. Keep your magic safe by like not eating things off of the sidewalk. I can't believe I need to say this, but I know I need to be told. And that's one way. We've also talked about, you and I, ways that precursors to magical ritual mirror. Like there's a reason that they're, you know, as far back as the far backs have been offerings made to Hygieia. There is literally goddesses of hygiene and you go to them and for, for just such circumstances. So if we're thinking about common precursors to magical ritual, like special diets or bathing, right? And if you're interested in doing the kind of magic that takes you down those routes, well, now would be a fantastic time to start. I'm sure it would make your magic and your whole life safer for you to be very, very, very clean, right? So these are simple ways that we can talk about currently, like hermetically sealing the practice. I know Back to the, you know, sometimes you got to have the window facing a certain way and it's got to be wide open. But if you think you're getting symptomatic, don't let your house get too cold. Like, I really am such a mom that I want to say shit like that, truly. If you are having upper respiratory symptoms, be very careful about the suffumigates that you're burning in your house. You may not want to be burning all sorts of herbs and plants if you are in any way immunocompromised and you could be at risk for transmission. We can go down this road forever and ever and ever. Maybe don't try doing any super dangerous trance work on one foot in your house, because if you fall and break your ankle, you're going to an emergency room full of people with COVID-19. And I strongly advise against that, right? But then there are the esoteric ways to make sure that your magic is safe during a pandemic. And, <laughs> you know, th there should probably have been a lot more disclaimers on this episode, because broadcast voice occasionally makes me sound like I have authority when really I'm a human hurricane and even my magic is pretty reactionary a lot of the time. But like making sure your magic is hermetically sealed with that knowledge is protection and prevention base also with those magical mundane overlapping things like hygiene, health, clean your, your special diet. I will never tell anyone how to eat, but it needs to be like the thing that I would advise people to do is are you eating? Are you drinking water? The most basic preparations that you'd go into before any sort of religious ritual apply doubly right now, and you also can't strip the religion out of them, because then you will lose the holiness of being alive while you're indoors and just removed from all people. So there's the practical stuff. Personally, despite being a complete train wreck, one way that I've found to keep my magic hermetically sealed while I am under quarantine is to, and here's, you know, we're going back into the keys, the keys now, is very rarely... Are we in traditional and historical texts? Very rarely are we doing magic alone. And just because we are in quarantine does not mean that we can't still replicate these effects, right? So like if you have friends that you trust or people in forums or you know that there's a blog where someone is writing about working with a specific saint, you start to compare and contrast your notes. You do what I love to call reality confirmation. Reality confirmation is somebody else tapping on the jar from the outside to make sure there aren't any bubbles. It's some, having someone else to check your seal from the outside before, you know, you go diving in or whatever the case may be. That's another thing that I found super helpful in terms of my safety is like, you know, I want to do this thing or here is what I'm thinking about. Or maybe like for me, honest, if I'm being real, I have had huge trouble doing anything the last few weeks. I'm so overworked, worried about the state of the world and being in New York. Like I said before, I can barely sit down and read. But what has gotten me 
to a place where I feel good and safe doing stuff is starting a project with a friend, for instance, where we're working on like a text together that will have two sides to it. And so we're putting in, you know, an hour of concentrated co-practice every day working on that, right? Having that reality confirmation, having someone on the outside of the circle, your scryer, if you're quarantined with them, you know, like, however you have to kind of rig that, it's rare in a lot of traditions and in a lot of common case studies for anyone to go into this totally alone. So you, d- you don't have to be. I think that's a fear maybe a lot of people have from the beginning is that magic is something you have to do alone and in secret and the alone part's not true. So having a friend that you can compare notes with, going on the search for resources. This is not, you know, a collegiate science. We're not going to claim any sort of like perpetual objectivity here. It's like, you'll know when you know. Like when I hear Josephine McCarthy speak, I know, I know I can trust everything she says. I know because what she says is speaking to me and it's reasonable and it's not prescriptive and it's not you can or can't do this. I just know. I don't need to explain why. My answer is generally, well, you fucking listen to Joe McCarthy talk and tell me you don't know, right? You go out and you do all of that. And however your reality confirmation comes, yeah, that's something I think about a lot in terms of safety is having a spotter, having a check-in person, having a buddy. That can be super, super crucial. That's definitely one way that I would suggest. So yeah, the practical bodily harm things, you know, don't subject yourself to any ice baths if you are also having to work outside. If you are also an essential worker and you are doing magic, do not force yourself to stay up for the correct planetary hour necessarily if your shift starts delivering packages at 3 a.m. the next morning. Like, now is the time to really lean into the knowledge that nothing cool or shredding has ever been done by the book in the history of people and begin to feel actually just how magic you are when you bend the process and it still works. That may be the final test, because really when we test anything along the lines of a seal, we have to run it through a few stress tests to see where and when it breaks. Maybe that's like the last one, you know? Meredith, this actually gels with a point that you had about maintaining emotional balance and having having humor, for example, and not forgetting to laugh. And let me just say, obviously, this is not humor of the situation. COVID-19 is very horrible and destructive and all that. But someone said to me the other day, you know, I haven't laughed at the things I used to enjoy or, or take at least a sense of slipping into a small pocket of rejuvenation, whether that is laughing or, you know, feeling some sort of contentment, or at least, as you mentioned, even if you're about to face the day as an essential worker or a nurse in a metropolis somewhere, how do you do that? How, how can you and how can the listeners and the magicians and esotericists, Meredith, listening to this really remind themselves or, or really find those small pockets of decompression amid all of this stuff going on? Well, this is where my best judgment as a helper in the world comes up against my limits of knowledge as the witch weenie du jour is just how to encourage people to find those small pockets, right? Here's where all of my hats are pointy, but here's where I switch them from like my librarian hat to my like kind of rough drill sergeant hat where I say, well, That's where the line is drawn, right? That's the line between man and mouse. That's the line between witch and weenie, because that is actually a really safe test of force. And once you can test force on yourself and see an end result, you realize how much power you have. That power is a power that you can then use to lift your burdens up and actually have a genuine laugh out of it. And what I mean by this is, okay, Devoid of all the outside arguments about morality, why a person may or may not be able to laugh about things or focus on things or do things, can you make yourself? And the answer is yeah. The answer is yes. You can you can fake a laugh. I can do it right now if I wanted to. So could you, right? Anyone can fake it. All you have to do is prove to yourself that you can. And if you're sitting there saying, I can't, I can't, I can't, that's like saying you couldn't stick your tongue out right now. Like it's just a functional lie of your direct experience. That is not what is being described here, which is like a genuine moment of solace, right? The genuine moment of solace comes after you realize you've re-empowered yourself to change things. And this is why, as we have said before, not in this particular conversation, but this is why we come back to banishing with laughter from chaos magic. It does not mean that at the end of your little chaos magic merry-go-round that you feel like busting up laughing about everything that happened. It means chaos magicians have identified for a very long time the power of forced laughter as banishing. And so that is literally what I mean. Like, this is one of those lines that you can draw that's actually kind of fun, where it's like, okay, you say you want to do magic. Well, this is a problem that you can fix. 
if really you can oversimplify the goal to like, I need to laugh, I need a moment of levity. That's a pretty safe stress test for like a, at the very least, the secret trick is if you tell someone to do this and they either try it or they get really mad, either way, it distracts them from their problems for five minutes, right? But on the surface, if you can figure out that even just in the simplest way, something can change because I forced it and it's not an outside condition necessarily, like it's in me, that's an empowering and edifying moment that will free up a bunch of stress and leave room for actual joy. Like, it's not that you can't find the moments of joy, it's that you are so overwhelmed and overworked and overburdened, you don't have any more room to hold anything else joyful or otherwise. Like, stop looking for more, see what you can get rid of first. And so much of the time, that is banishing the weight that you carry around from it. And yeah, it's a test. It's a test that people can put themselves through. Like, can I force myself even temporarily, even if only you still feel like shit before, during and after, but you proved that actually you can force yourself to make a laughing sound. You just proved you have control over some weird area of the universe. And yeah, from there, room for joy opens up. I really do think so. Sometimes it is just about strong arming your brain. And of course, I say this is a person with massive executive dysfunction issues who pretty frequently myself have to divert to the magic of all I have to do is wash the goddamn dishes. Why? Like, I, I joke with people. I'm like, I can get demons in my living room. I can't get a clean sink in my house. Like, I can't focus on shit long enough to do shit. That's the equivalent force. Forcing yourself to laugh, doing some dishes. Probably they're going to have about the same effect, which is just putting your brain into flow, taking your mind off of things for a minute, giving you a moment of relief. Because really what we're doing is what we're perceiving as a potential moment of relief isn't lining up with our direct experience, right? What we know to be relieving moments, getting hugs from our friends, walking outside, going to a concert eh, against the law right now, right? So we can't find those moments of joy because we're still looking for them in their old form. One great moment of joy is recognizing the absurdity of the new form. Even if it's the most miserable laugh you've ever given, just do it and then see what happens. One of those other areas that I know is very near and dear to your heart as well, as well as mine, is especially with COVID-19 and everything going on, is the relationship between, you know, creators, artists, esotericists, and their pets and their dogs. Oh, and yeah. getting love from animals. Yes. Can you share with the, I know many listeners, I know for a fact, because I've heard from you. That many listeners out there, you know, have either, you know, cats, dogs, an entire constellation of creatures that they, some of them even used in ritual. I, I know one person who uses their dog as a scryer, meaning like their ears will perk up and certain things oh, will happen as like an indication. Absolutely. And then meanwhile, I'm going to get it wrong. And some asshole who just already hates me for going off on chaos magic is going to be real mad because I'm probably going to attribute it to the wrong book. But I think and the wrong person, it might be Phil Hine. And he's a hero. So I'm sorry if it's Phil Hine. Which book is it? Is it like advanced cyber magic? Anyway, one of those classic chaos magic books, there's just a whole page in it that's like, oh, and by the way, if you have a dog, you're not the type of person who I ever want to know because dogs are terrible and anyone who'd have them is awful. And I'm just like, wait, what? Which is, it's really, really funny, and it's totally, absolutely what I would expect, and, and no hard feelings. It's true. Who would volunteer? Like, you just made a pact, a lifelong pact. You bound yourself to a demon when you get a dog because you are at that animal's beck and call if you live in the city and you can't just let your dog outdoors. But this is my actual favorite thing about it, and I have talked to a bunch of people about this, but a bunch is a small bunch here. And what shocks me really is that like the bunch is so small because this seems like a pretty cool thing that more people would be talking about. But I'm fascinated. Again, our conversation earlier about reality confirmation, right? In the instructions in the book, when you go by the book, you, you bring a virgin child to be your scryer, or you have some companions with you. Every book has some like set of stipulations about the companions that you're supposed to have with you, right? And I think it is, I want to say it's Clavicula Solomonis, but there is a big thing right in one of these books that is so great. And I need to like actually memorize it verbatim one of these days, but it's basically like, so if you're preparing to do the operation in this part, you will need to have with you a small gathering two to three of like children and or one really good dog is fine. And I lost it when I found that reference for the first time, because I basically realized that whoever wrote that grimoire was saying one dog is as good as three human children, which is true. <laughs> <laughs> as far back as, as those grimoires, they 
had one dog sub in for three to four people. And like, that's in the text, right? So I love this because so much of the time when we talk about the history of animals and magic, it's archetypical and symbolic. And we're, oh, you know, the snake and the apple, whatever, you know, whatever we're looking at at the time, or it's the augury of birds. We're looking at like animals as, or the flip side of that is everyone who colloquially refers to their like house cat, even if it is a black cat, even if it is a lovely black cat, uh, as their familiar, which is really funny. And, you know, that's kind of a silly thing to think about. And then you do it again and you dig back into the grimoires and you find out there's all this language about magicians having dogs. And it's really, really funny. So, like, pers- I have a rescue dog. I have a rescue dog that is incredibly exciting and also a complete demon. And I have information on this not from myself, but because, you know, I bring him to work with me quite frequently. And the people around my office, without provocation, began to just naturally refer to my dog as the demon or the gremlin if you look at my internet, it's just mostly my dog, who is this 17-pound, like, six generations deep Chihuahua Terrier sex accident who was adopted from the swamps of Hurricane Harvey. Uh, he looks like a demon. And he, since the day that I brought him home, has, like, never had an accident in the house, wears little sweaters, will try to join in on conversations at work by just, like, talking air quotes, in conversations. He has different tones of voice for different people that he interacts with regularly, like, I can look at my dog sometimes and speak a full few sentences like I'm talking to a person and he will just do what it is that I'm telling him somehow. He's been with me for two years now and I don't really understand it. But there's also a lot of other magical aspects about pets that I love to think about this because like it's another abstraction. But like, for instance, we talk about servitors or, you know, other spirits that we can bind to things or to tasks to serve a certain purpose, right? And me as a person with like really incredibly powerful social anxiety for someone who was on broadcast television for several years, which is all true, it's all true. Having my dog, my scryer, my forerunner, kind of means that I am invisible. My dog is an invisibility talisman. Absolutely fucking no one is looking at me. And this is totally radically different from my life a few years ago when I was still on TV and I would ride the train in the city to go to MTV every day. Hey, I've seen your band. Like, it's really, really nice. I love it. I'm just a basket case. I'm a mess and I never know what to say. I'm really awkward and I stink. And so, (laughs) yeah, having my dog with me is instantly like, even when they ask questions of me, they're not waiting around to hear the answers. They're just, they're just looking my dog in the eye. And so he's great. He's like an invisibility spell. He's also like, I understand implicitly what you mean when you describe the person who uses their dog as a sort of scryer. Like, absolutely. I've had endless experiences. Like, as soon as I brought my dog home, he identified that there's already like a lot of stuff going on in the house. You know, I live in a very old house for Brooklyn. But beyond that, like, I've cut workings in the middle. Not many times, but at least once or twice now, I have shut down my shit completely because my dog has had such a horrified reaction to whatever I was doing. Like partway through, I will adjust course or once or twice it has just been like, all right, this is not working. Shut it down. He has no reason to be reacting the way he does because he is a lunatic and very talkative and really fun and really friendly and has no sense of his size. And so, you know, his my dog's name is Bernard. And when people ask what kind of dog he is, I tell them he's a St. Bernard. And then when they see that he weighs 17 pounds, I say he's a St. Bernard of Clairvaux. He's a Rosicrucian. So (laughs) he flies off the handle. He flies off the handle constantly, but in good ways. He's really delightful. He's really goofy and really fun. And he loves all dogs. He loves all people. So when I tell you that on the rare occasion that my dog goes nuts in a bad way, I shut my shit down. Because when he's done that with people before, it's been when we're like out walking at night and I don't realize someone eight times my size is coming up behind me. And when he does it in my apartment, when I have shit going on, I shut the shit down. So like, I completely, I compl- I've seen him do it with living humans on the street when like something looked sketchy. I absolutely believe him. If absolutely nothing is going on in the house except for this, and he goes nuts, I'll look into that. So I, I'm with the original book. I will gladly continue to trade three human children for a dog every time. <laughs> Mine especially. So yeah, I think as that relates to the quarantine, if anyone is considering, of course, fostering or adopting right now, that is one of the most worthwhile things you can do with your time. And I will be, you know, with I never want to be prescriptive and tell other people how to work. But if you want to get really, really, really fucking in and out level good with magic, get a dog, get a pet that involves a lot of responsibility. Maybe you are having trouble dragging ass to light your candles on the altar every day. Like you and I have talked about like 
daily practice. You stressed in TCI over and over again. Develop a daily practice. Even if it's small, start small, something every single day that helps you build routine, right? I have ADD. I'm not getting anywhere near that. But I have a dog and he gets tons of attention every day. And I have been able to reshape a schedule around it. And like, that works. Excellent sense of responsibility and helping animals in need is very crucial. And of course, lots of people are adopting dogs and cats now because of the quarantine. Responsible pet ownership is delightful, and Satan smiles upon those who rescue poor animals from the street, especially the ones that are extra cool because they have three legs, or a severe underbite, like my idiot dog, or whatever the case may be. Adopting animals, Satan told me himself that you get extra personal pan pizzas when you die if you adopt a shelter animal, so I advise everyone go do that. (laughs) PSA for shelter dogs. Especially, I, I was hearing that uh, because veterinarian offices are, you know, essential services, quote unquote, quote unquote, during the COVID-19 pandemic, that actually the number of visits are going up because people who would just go to the nine to five every day and leave their animals at home are now spending a ton more time with them and noticing things like, oh, we need to go, you know, so how does that factor in? We're like, people are spending, especially in this time of self-isolation and self-quarantine from humans, like mm-hmm. people are spending a lot more time with their dogs and their cats and their pets. It's absolutely true. I'm just, I'm in the luxurious sub 1% incredibly, like, the very cool things about my job are rock and roll professional, huge garden on the roof, Enochian magic actually happening at Kickstarter. But then the actually coolest thing about my job is that we are a dog friendly office. So I am in the sub 1% of people for whom my bat demon dog never leaves my side. He already, like, I am in that position all the time, which is really crazy. I take my dog with me everywhere. He comes to work with me. He's out in the street with me. Half the bookstores in town let him in, right? But everybody else, oh man, pets across America are absolutely psyched right now. So yeah, maybe for people for people who have pets and they're kind of looking at them now with their eyebrow raised as the cat like licks its nuts or whatever, like look into the history of animal and human co-magical working. That is kind of fun. Like if you have nothing else to do this afternoon, grab your dog and a scrying mirror. That's going to kill two birds with one stone, because if it doesn't teach you something about animal husbandry and scrying magic, I guarantee you're going to get that laugh you were looking for. (laughs) One or the other. Scry with your dog. That's my total advice. What do you think, Meredith, are some of the biggest things that maybe really, and we were talking about this during the TCI interview, because it's one of the questions I love to ask is, what do you think are some of the biggest things as we go through COVID-19 that people are either blowing out of proportion with COVID-19 or they are underrating with COVID-19 as it relates to either the kinetics of it or even its impact with musicians and artists and creators. Like when it comes to misconceptions, what are some of the big things that you wish people understood better or really thought about more versus some of the things that maybe they might be thinking about too much? What I wish people thought about more with regard to the impact that COVID-19 is having on the arts is the fact that constantly we're going back and forth in our culture about whether or not corporations are people. And in the same way, we can look at industries as people. They can be here or not here or switches that are like on or off. Music isn't really that kind of industry. And as illustrated, it's like now that streaming has been taken off the map, musicians can basically play shows and sell records to get money. And so what people don't really seem to understand, even the people who are talking about, you know, the music, we care, we want to give you money, we want to, what people aren't really taking into account just in thinking of music on the surface is that music isn't musicians any more than any other industry is what it is. And musicians are parents and their daycare staffers and their office workers and By and large, in a lot of scenes, they are workers in the waitstaff and restaurant and service industry. Oftentimes people in bands, they work in other music venues or they do, you know, whatever the case may be. So the thing that I think people are understanding the least is that it's not South by Southwest was canceled this year. South by Southwest won't be canceled next year. It's like literally there will be no live music until the restaurant and bar industry has opened back up and become financially staffed physically staffed and salient and safe and up and running to a point where they can start thinking about having shows again and booking them in advance. That's what people aren't thinking of is the fact that music isn't an on off switch. There's just no music right now. And then there's going to be music. It's like what people aren't understanding is that because of that past history, where we got to a point where touring and selling physical records was the way that musicians make their money. uh, We were totally unprepared for this. And 
in thinking about it, people who aren't familiar with like who actually makes up the bulk of musicians in the world are saying, oh, that's so sad. There should be resources for musicians. Well, those musicians are also like inhabitants of a place and they're they're members of various other industries and stuff it's like this abstract thing it's almost like it's 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 as abstract as saying save the whales you know like oh poor music it's like no like it's bars it's restaurants it's it's tech companies it's all these different things and so there really is no immediate answer or possibly even a long lead answer to when music is going to be normal again and so hypothetically what do you think that's the biggest thing that i think people are underestimating about COVID-19, especially with regard to the arts, is just how much more is going to have to happen other than nobody's getting sick and dying anymore before we can even begin to think about live music again. Like, as needed as it is, live music may in fact be one of the last concerns that we have, not intentionally necessarily, but because it's predicated on so many other industries being up and running. What do I think people are blowing out of proportion? The idea that we all have to do it the same way, chiefly, like as soon as a crisis happens, any kind of crisis, it could be a ton of artists getting kicked off a certain platform. It could be something that's happening at the level of society at large, like COVID-19. Someone will within a day say, well, here's what you do instead. You just you upload your songs over here instead or you do this over here instead. People are blowing how easy they think it is out of proportion for sure. And people are blowing the ease with which musicians can just put their stuff online way out of proportion. Like the random, not at all necessary smile babe level comment that no musician wants to hear right now is you should just do a live stream because like that's not how it works uh, in any sense of the word. And so, yeah, what people are dramatically underestimating is just how long it's going to be before we can exist in a world that has engageable music in it again and what people are dramatically overestimating is how equipped musicians are on the axis of the technology that is available to actually just start doing this the same but online it's it's way blown out of proportion this is why i'm encouraging people to start coming up with new models as fast as possible because it's all that's being suggested and in most cases it's just very very difficult it's it's amazing to do live streams what i'm trying to stress here by the way i should maybe be more particular it's very difficult to do a live stream like you'd go play a show. It is not the same as picking up your guitar on stage and playing for a bunch of people, even if only in the sense of it's going to sound different over your phone or over your live stream, right? It's great to do live streams. You need to think outside the box. And it's not easy. It's creative work. It's a whole other kind of project, right? But it is being blown out of proportion how easy it is for musicians to recover. They say, oh, you can do a GoFundMe for your bar. You can just go on a live stream and get people to watch it. Like, what planet do you guys live on? That's my over under. People are, even the people with the best intentions in a couple months may be annoyed by some wonky live streams. And then they're going to be feeling it when it takes another, you know, year or two for live music to get back up and running. Because that is what happens when over a creeping and increasing period of time, all venues become bars and alcohol companies start sponsoring all the stages at major festivals and blah, blah, blah. We've backed ourselves into a corner where now most live music happens in alcohol supported settings. And so we're going to have to wait till the bars open back up. It's just, it's this massive indefatigable net. Parts of that, depending on where you're standing uh, are exactly what's being over and underestimated. I think. Yeah. This kind of gels with the incredible work that you do connecting creators and artists with support and so for the listeners out there who are esotericists or they maybe have a cool project or something that they want that they've wanted to do for a while and now they're dedicating a lot more cognitive time to it during COVID-19 but they don't know where they could possibly get support or if there are people out there who maybe want to support creators and musicians and artists can you share about like what are some of the key resources what are some of the key things that whoever hears this they should check out whether they have a project or whether they want to support a project well here's a real funny thing i'm i'm going to get you with this one cuz i know you think you know what i'm saying but you don't kickstarter kickstarter is the resource for those people but not the way you think, because I do not mean going and running Kickstarter campaigns necessarily. Although, for the record, that is what I do for a living. It's my favorite thing to do is help people. And if you are working on your project and you really want to like publicly fund it, you want to achieve more collaborators or get support for the next round of something or anything like that, absolutely. I work at Kickstarter and I'm allergic to bullshit. Therefore, I'm here to tell you that it is great and we would love to help you. But... 
I mean Kickstarter as a resource because for the last two weeks, our staff has been spinning out the most incredible resource lists and they're all over the front page of the website. So for artists and musicians and magicians and filmmakers and designers and chefs and business owners and writers and illustrators and everyone, including all, you know, 80 bazillion of my tarot creators that come through all the time, Kickstarter and the Creative Independent, of course, are full resource lists. We have everything from tax assistance to mental health aid to state by state grants to immediate emergency grants to lists of artists who are live streaming in some way themselves that day that you can watch to keep from getting bored. And then of course, like above and beyond that, we're rolling out new stuff that we're building all the time. That's actually tools meant to help creators who are using our site do it more effectively while they're quarantined. So things like enabling all your YouTube and Facebook live streams to be embedded in your Kickstarter campaign page and and fun little treats like that. So for artists who are struggling on material and practical levels or stress-wise and esoterically, or you just don't know where to turn to start, I can tell you with 100% sincerity and authenticity that my wonderful co-conspirators at Kickstarter have like turned their lives over to making resources like that available. And again, like the whole thing about what they've been doing that's amazed me so much is that it's such a wealth of practical information combined with like relief and joy. Like they're actual resources. They're not, they don't pretend that all humans need, like every human needs money. Every human needs health. We know that we knew that before we didn't need this horrific tragedy to remind us of that. But like, it neutralizes the capitalist argument that that's basically all humans are worth. And it remembers that we need like care and community and joy too. So if anyone is seriously struggling and listening or wants to consider possible options for their art, or of course, above and beyond that, again, if you're thinking about publicly launching or funding your project, I must say good things about the place where I work because the place where I work is so good. Kickstarter is so full of resources. And of course the creative independent, our fabulous sister site that is, the ad-free pirate ship for the aforementioned joy. They publish articles every day talking with creators about this, about COVID-19 and about other aspects of their practice. They also have guides and a lot of the guides that are being re-upped and reintroduced and, and put out lately are guides to financial solvency, guides to how to survive getting laid off, but also guides to, you know, stay sane when there are crisis conditions around. So, you know, this is the company that I work for. They're very, very cool. TCI is the coolest and we, yeah, we basically realized that data doesn't have physical weight. So we've loaded the front page down with like as many resources for struggling artists as we've been able to manage physically. And that's a good place to start because most of it is links out to other massive lists. So depending on your discipline, your geolocation, whatever the case may be, I would start there. And then, of course, if you are on the flip side, if you're looking for resources like, oh, man, I'm actually excited and I think I am ready to do this and you think that you might want to run a campaign well, my DMs are open, and I'll leave that there. <laughs> and everyone is actually like always welcome to get in touch with me, because it is my job, and it is my joy. And so if there are people out there listening to this broadcast who are like, I have a tarot deck, or a musical about robots, or a hoverboard, or a grimoire, or whatever the case may be, or even if you aren't sure you know you're going to make something, but you're not sure if it could come here. If you have questions or you want to talk about the creative process, this is quite literally what I do all day. That option is also open. You know, I say that knowing it's a full on monkey's paw, but like be in touch with me because the witch at the edge of the wood is here and ready to support your creative dreams, I guess. <laughs> I would recommend, first of all, listeners, please follow Meredith Graves on Twitter, obviously. Her DMs are open. She's a fantastic resource if you are an artist, if you are a creator, if you are an esotericist. In fact, Meredith, you were mentioning, you and I were talking, you know, there might be people out there who maybe they're coming across a really big manuscript that mm -hmm. would take a lot of effort to have translated. And then once you translate it, it's like 900 pages. And it's like, well, who's going to want to publish this? What kind of funding would be available to even be necessary to get someone to publish this? And, and you were talking about that. So there's so many resources out there. Tons and tons. And what's more, the cool thing about where I work, the thing that I love the most is that I, like once a day, I get to do a lap around the office and have you guys, and they'll be like, yeah, people do all sorts of crazy stuff. No, look at what this person is doing. It's unprecedented. It's just, could you ever think of anything this crazy? And it's like, 
it's always something that is so obvious that like the world really wants. And it's like, I totally see how this didn't your thousand page book. That is the coolest book that's ever existed. I can totally see why no cool person existed that was willing to make this. Thank you for bringing it here. Cause clearly this shit needed to get made. Like I think about, especially when it comes to books on Kickstarter, the, the wonderful like arch Lord of publishing at Kickstarter. Her name is Margo. She's a really good friend of mine. She's brilliant. Specifically, when it comes to book projects like that, I'm always so grateful because when they come in and they're the thing that no one else wants to do, like you may, you might even at some levels at Kickstarter be dealing with someone who's like, I have to self fund this because nobody wants to do my thing. And then a great example from Margot's world where the books are so beautiful and they do this all the time was the big box, the visual novel that came out last year, Dracula, the evidence right? It's like the entire novel of Dracula, but it's a box of objects that you unpack. And it's like, who's going to make a novel that's a box of things? What? <laughs> like 900 page manuscript. Okay, try it's not even a book. And then meanwhile, Guillermo del Toro is obsessed with it. And he tweets about it. And we're off to the races. And it's Kickstarter. And it's a fucking blast, like for that reason. So when I say, if you call me up and tell me that your idea is to teach underwater music box construction, in a tank of tomato soup, I'm probably going to ask if you can get on the phone in like 10 minutes. So don't worry if your shit is weird. Your perception that nobody wants your thing is probably wildly inaccurate. It's arguably oftentimes more like mediocre capitalism refuses to acquiesce to the magnificence of your thing. And you can come sit with us. <laughs> We'd like you to come sit with us. Meredith Graves inviting us to sit down at the table, setting the record straight, making sure to clear up all those misconceptions that people have about the self-perceived obstacles of creativity and magic. Meredith Graves, she's a witch, a magician, an open sorceress, a director of music for Kickstarter, among a constellation of other things. And Meredith, thank you just so much for really taking the time and stopping by and, and helping our listeners through the COVID-19 pandemic and beyond. Just, just really appreciate your wisdom and your availability. Thank you. Yeah, if anything, if anyone is listening to this now and wondering, should I be in touch? This is your sign. Go open the email. This is your sign. I am waiting for your email. Send it now. <laughs> Listeners, I hope you enjoyed that chat with Meredith Graves as much as I did. Meredith is, in my humble estimation, one of the key, fantastic people who we all need to be hearing from and taking notes from before, during, and after COVID-19. That's whether it's on ways to work our magic in quarantine or starting a new artistic, esoteric, or musical project, and so much more. Also, listeners, please make sure to check out the personally recommended by Meredith links in the video and podcast description for more resources for both magic magicians, and creators. And speaking of creators and inspiration, if you are so inspired, you can always check out and support Glitch Bottle on Patreon. That's patreon.com slash Glitch Bottle. And you could subscribe to Glitch Bottle on YouTube, iTunes, Spotify, Spreaker.com, and Stitcher Radio. And leaving an awesome review is always most welcome. As always, this is Alexander Eth reminding you to invoke often, uncork the uncommon, and keep the light. <laughs>